Alright, in this video we're going to be making a caliper base depth measuring attachment. Uh, to start off here I'm just face building off the top of the part. As you can see the, the material stock is much bigger than I would need to make one base and that is because I'm making two bases. So once I get the faces, that face uh, cleaned up, I switch to a half inch end mill and I'm profile cutting along the surface closest to the regular operator position and I zeroed the readout that's Y0 in absolute. I'm just taking a quick cleanup, cleanup cut across this surface and I'm going to zero the X axis so I know that if I need a three inch wide part I need to move over three inches plus the radius of the cutter three and a quarter inches. This piece of stock maybe it was about 3.2 inches wide so I had to Take a couple passes, uh, checking my size, and taking a climb cut for my finished pass. Remember, you can take climb cuts on manual machines uh, if they're not heavy cuts. It's tool pressure that we have to avoid. And now, as I'm cutting across this surface, I'm going to zero the y-axis again, but not um, on the incremental setting. And that allowed me to uh, work away from a y-axis zero um, or each base independent now I'm roughing out the material here and you can see or you will be able to see at some point that instead of doing a full layout I went to my finished coordinates and then I lightly touched down and made a circular mark that I'm using as my uh, my layout reference line now I roughed all that out taking conventional cuts and I'm taking a climb cut here to my finished dimensions and I'm probably removing about 25 thousandths or so stock not a heavy cut there's a good view you can see the, the circular marks where I came came and touched down now layout lines are better but this also worked as you can see by the evidence of this video and just mathematically I've plotted out um, I made X0 the center of the part, so I know exactly what dimension I'm cutting back to in my X axis, and in the Y axis it was the, the same thing. Um, somewhere I've jotted down those numbers uh, off camera, there must be a piece of paper sitting on the table, or uh, I don't know where I had it. Now the the little cutaways I'm taking my climb cut here and then they're going to be complete so the, the outer profile of the two parts are pretty much finished and now I'm going to cut the slot um, it should be pretty obvious that the uh, slot needs to be perfectly perpendicular to the base uh, the bottom of the base piece otherwise you'll be introducing a cosine error with all your measurements you don't want that now the print says to cut this slot to a 0.635 width. I measured my calipers. Um, they measured 0.630. And I went just a couple thousandths over that. So the finish width was 0.632. That was a good fit on my calipers. I didn't really feel like fighting them in and out and trying to have a size for size fit. And uh, 2 thousandths clearance total I'm not worried about getting uh, too much error in my reading now this here I'm just gonna rough out um, this little pocket because a lot of indicators have sorry a lot of calipers have uh, big bulky uh, end plates that keep the, the depth rod where it's supposed to be and again I'm just hitting my numbers um, I predetermined how far I'm going to go uh, positive and negative in the X and then how far positive in this on this side how far positive I'm going to go up and Y and it's just the finished dimension minus the radius of the cutter when I hop over to the back side I'm going to reach up pop the readout and now I'm either I'm probably on the incremental setting and it's just rinse and repeat
one thing I changed on this print is I went ahead and uh, I decided I was going to make these through holes. I'm more interested in having a greater amount of thread engagement. And I also really don't think it looks bad if you cut your your uh, length of thread to be um, flush on the back side. I think it actually looks pretty attractive. So that's the, the thought process behind not following the print on my, my holes here. I, I do have bottoming taps, uh, spiral flute, so uh, it's just a little personal preference here. Oh, now watch this. The first hole, everything's good. That one, I blew off the chips, but I didn't re-lubricate the tap, and then that tap stuck in the part. Now, on the other remaining holes, I make sure that I lube before I uh, power tapped in. You, it's not, I can't overstate how important it is to lubricate your taps. There is an extreme amount of friction involved with tapping, so make sure you don't forget like you just saw me. Um, now I'm cutting the hat off. Uh, you know, I'm sort of taking a little bit of a CNC type approach. Um, and people were doing this kind of stuff before CNC machines, but it's pretty common to see it now. Not getting too carried away with my depth of cuts. Uh, the R8 taper and a Bridgeport spindle with a 3 inch face mill with 90 degree shoulder um, insert design. It cuts pretty hard, so I'm just letting it tell me what it wants. You see there as I break through, it's paper thin. Now when I milled down to begin with, I think I went 480 depth because I had a half inch sticking above the, the jaw surface. So I was able to peel away that, and now I can take some lighter cuts to get my, my finished measure, measurement here. Quick check there. Take my last little skim cut. Maybe 20 top or so, hard to say. The finish looks acceptable. It could have been better. Um, I'm over at the bandsaw. Splitting them apart, and I need to knock the tops down to the finish dimension, and then I'm going to go to town making chamfers. I opted to make the chamfers in the, the mill here. Um, probably could have just walked over to the belt sander, uh, but you have more control. Um, so if you're you know a student, you're doing these projects, they're going to get graded. You need that kind of control and accuracy if you're just making this to use belt sander all day long. Cutting 45s with a single flute tool like this, just remember um, you only have one cutting edge, so you kind of have to dial back your feed rate a little bit if you want to have a really good finish. And you see I'm utilizing the stop, so I can set it, repeat the cut over and over. But I do make sure to get rid of the burr, and everything has to be clean, or you're going to have one, one chamfer, or actually it's a bevel, that is much larger than the other. And when I say deburred, I mean the actual part surface I'm clamping. Okay, now we're on to the screws. Um... I am using a lathe again that has a digital readout. Kind of being lazy, that's a couple of videos in a row. When I was working out in industry, or the first 15 years, um, I didn't use a single manual lathe that had a, a readout. A lot of times when I'm doing little stuff like this around the shop at school, I I like being lazy. It's fun. You, you program the X, you set the Z0. You really don't have to think very hard. You have to pay attention, but it's it's pretty easy. It's very fast. I'm taking a couple little light passes, um, spring cuts there, because that's a quarter inch diameter, and the brass was definitely deflecting away. Doing my little thread relief. I'm going to pop some 45 chamfers. Always chamfer your threaded section either w right before you're done with your thread being finished, or before you start taking my passes here uh, always check make sure you have your machine set for the right 
Dread pitch. Uh, Writing's pretty straightforward. Just hit your marks. Uh, I kind of I edit out a few of the passes uh, when I'm checking the thread for proper fit. I didn't really feel like measuring my pitch diameter. I just went by feel on this one. Part that off. I actually didn't mean to actually part it off off, but that's what I end up doing. Face the backside, chamfer it. Now we're going to take this little part over to the milling machine. Um, I'm making a fixture plate that I include this. But what I uh, have to do is I have to screw the part in from the bottom side because the standard rotating cutter, right handed cutter, if I screw the part from the top side, the tool pressure would grab and unscrew the part out of the fixture. But if I screw it in from the bottom and then run my cutter through the plate, the cutting forces will actually tighten the part into the fixture plate harder. And uh, I'm not worried about it stripping it out or anything like that. Uh, I, I snug them up firmly um, with a set of pliers. And I'm just dropping down through my holes to get all my little uh, quarter inch, no, eighth inch radius relief uh, cuts. Now this is a good looking part, um, especially after you bead blast it. And then I'm using this cold blue, which heating our parts up and putting them in used mortar oil looks better. Um, this looks good, but there's a few spots that are thin. Uh, however, just all together, um, after you bead blast it, you can hide a lot of your, your tool marks, the brass, the contrast with the flat black. Uh, it's very nice looking. I'm going to check this thing out, see what we can get for accuracy. I'm uh, I'm just using a flat ground surface of a V block and a one, two, three block here. Um, so I was finding that it was pretty consistent of uh, plus or minus one thousandths, which if you need more accuracy than that, you should be using a depth micrometer. Um, overall, this is a relatively easy project. Um, not that time consuming and you're making a great tool so it's a it's a good one to make thanks for watching